Welcome to Community Voices with Carly Lissa Thorne. And today I have with me the author Nahid Savul. And we're going to be talking about our book, The Ruby Tear Catcher. So welcome, Nahid. Thank you, Carly. And I would love for, for you to I'd love to hear you say your name properly. I, I there's always such unique, beautiful names, and I love it when they're from different cultures and to hear them say it properly. Okay, I'd be happy to. So uh, you can call me Nahid Sewell. Thank you so much for that. So I would love to hear your story, the inspiration behind even the title of the book. So what was your inspiration behind the title of the book? Um, well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It's probably one of my most frequently asked questions. Um, tear catchers are really actually an ancient uh, Persian vessel. That's, that's the word I will use. They were um, used in old Persia. When a sultan went to war, he would give a tear catcher to each of his wives in the harem. And uh, during his absence, you know, he's gone for months at war, let's say, uh, you know, he would return after several months and he would check the tear catchers and uh, look to see who had collected the most tears, which signified to him that's the one who had missed him the most. And so she became the favored wife. Uh, so interesting that that's an ancient Persian um, a tradition and vessel, uh, but I decided to use the name because of the theme, one of the themes of uh, the Ruby Tear Catcher is uh, about how similar we are and how our religions really um, are really more of the same. We are one, we're, we're not unique, they're not all that different. So um, as such, I uh, came to know that uh, tear catchers are also referenced in the Old Testament in Psalm 56 verse 8 when David prays to God um, he refers he says thou tellest thy wanderings uh, put thy tear in thy bottle so reference is made in the Old Testament to tear bottles and tear catchers and um, it, uh, rumor has it, according to the apocryphal books, that Mary Magdalene carried a tear catcher to the tomb of Jesus. So I thought that it was a really good name to choose for the book because it really uh, helps us to understand how uh, our religions are the same, that the objective of uh, organized religion is really to bring us together, not to tear us apart. And of course, I added the color ruby to it because it's it's uh, the color of passion and uh, the color that I felt helped us to uh, distinguish how we felt about uh, religion and the role that it should play in our world today. No, I like that. Now, also on your bookshelf behind you, I think you have one behind there. Is that correct? Can you show yeah. us what it looks like? Sure, I uh, I can grab that. Um, So uh, I don't know if you can see the entire thing, but this is about the right size. So uh, I would say it's about uh, 12 inches long. And um, I actually, uh, so I'm going to demonstrate this for you. So the, the idea is, as you can see, it's got the tip here. You put it to your eye and allegedly cry and collect your tears in there. Uh, I actually had this uh, made for me in the color ruby you would never find it in a ruby color in Persia but I uh, I guess uh, you know I actually have an antique one it's it's in a traditional Persian blue color but because of the name of the book I had to have this replicated beautiful beautiful now I'd love also to hear I, I was beautiful the way you described why you chose the ruby tear catcher as a title for your book can you also now get into a little bit of what does your book, what is the passion behind your book in terms of what is the message that you'd like to get out there from people from the book? And then go into a little bit of your story, because obviously the book is your story. Yeah, so thank you, Carly. That's, um, you know, the, the book and, and the reason why I wanted to write it um, has, has several different angles. One of the reasons why I wanted to tell this story was because uh, you know, I grew up in, in Iran, and I grew up under the Shah's regime uh, uh, during an era where 
my life, the way I dressed, and, and the way I lived probably mirrored yours in this country. But that's not the image that people have of, of Persians or anyone in the Middle East. And I just kind of thought it was a good idea to help reshape this image that Iranians or people from the Middle East are fundamentalist Muslims and that we're always all enshrouded in, in, you know, in the chadors and covered up because uh, really my life was very much like yours and I uh, dressed uh, then as I do now. But what happened is, of course, the Islamic Revolution swept the country and uh, transformed the way people uh, dress and the way people uh, uh, think and behave and work and uh, rights changed, uh, laws changed. Uh, there was a lot of impact on people's lives. So I wanted to share the story for a number of reasons. One was because I wanted to help reshape this image that we're all these fundamentalists that uh, Muslims are. We are not, so that was one. Another objective was, and, and I decided to put a laser focus on um, the impact of what I consider religious fundamentalism uh, at the hands of a few, how that affected the women of Iran and the women of the Middle East. Um, so many of our rights were taken away, so many of our rights were, uh, you know, brushed under the carpet and um, women's careers, uh, legal age for marrying, all those things were impacted and, uh, you know, progression of women in Iran, which of course follow, follows through uh, many other countries in the Middle East, was really impacted by that. Uh, so wanted to get the message out. And I wanted to be, uh, as I consider myself one of the very fortunate women from Iran, uh, I wanted to uh, be the voice for the women who don't have one of their own. So what would you say to some of the women that are in Iran and don't have that voice? What would be some tips and tools you could give to people to stay strong and to take the path of choosing their own path? Uh, you know, I, as I said, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I had a father who believed in me and I had a father who treated me like he treated my brother. He didn't see me as different, not that different anyway. Um, so that, that definitely is, is a huge, huge help. So if women have fathers or uncles, and, and I am focusing on the men because they are the ones still in the Middle East who uh, make a lot of these decisions for their daughters. The mothers certainly have influence, but ultimately, uh, even today, the fathers are the primary decision makers when it comes to their daughter's fate, uh, giving them the education. So what I would say to those women is setting aside, uh, you know, having that, being in that type of a forward-thinking family, in, in every place, in every home, in every environment, there's still some opportunity, as small as it is, get the education. Because I think when you have education, you have power, and you can stand on your own feet. Now, I, I say that with full recognition that sometimes in some countries, like in Afghanistan, the women aren't allowed uh, those opportunities. Uh, that's where I want to come in to play, is to spread the word and help to make a difference, even if it's one day at a time, even if it's one person at a time. But to those women, I would say, uh, keep in mind your sisters who do have a strong voice are out there rooting for you, but you do have to help yourself too. You are never beyond help. You have a network, just do the best you can, get your education, and be able to stand on your own feet if you need to. Now, what would you say to some of the parents that are out there? What can the parents do? You know, like you said, you had a really, really good father that encouraged you and believed in you. So what can you say to some of the Iranian parents that they can do for their children to help their children have what you have? 
And um, I don't just mean Iranian parents. I mean parents everywhere. I mean, because I think that's the thing. You know, we see we see children that that have had really amazing parents and have, have allowed them to be independent and have confidence as you do. And as other children have had struggles, whether it be disabilities or illnesses or whatever. You know what I'm saying? There's there's always been a parent that's made a child believe in themselves and have stood on their two feet. So I think it's I think it's more and more important these days. I think to have people like you and other people have succeeded give messages to parents. What are tips and tools to give to parents to raise children that are confident, can stand on their two feet and have the ability to do that? So what are some tips and tools we can start giving to parents? Well, um, it, it's basic uh, psychology and, and so what I'm gonna say is first of all treat your ch children equally. Um, if one child needs a little more attention due to a disability or some other during a period for special circumstances, give them that. Uh, it, it's okay, but make sure that you provide each of the children that same opportunity when they are in a time of need. But the basic psychology of it is this. In order to instill confidence in children, which I believe my father did for me, uh, say the words. And, and it isn't to say, I love you. That's easy to say. Say it and mean it. But it is so easy to criticize. It's much easier to criticize and see the negative things than to do the opposite, which is on the positive side. So here's my rule of thumb. Uh, for every negative, shall I say, or for every criticism that you want to give your children, make sure that you start with three positives. And that's where it's going to make an impact. Give them the three positives first and make them real and mean it and be sincere. Don't just make something up and say your hair looks pretty, but say something substantive that matters to the child and their psyche and then provide that feedback uh, in the area where you see an opportunity for them to grow. That's how you help someone with their level of confidence. And I truly believe that despite the fact that I, I always wanted to please my parents. I always wanted to do the, the best I could and to do the right things. It is because they made me feel that they believed in me. I think that's really important these days. I think really kids these days are yearning to, and I agree with you, it's not just to be loved, it's to really have that sense of being heard too. And like you said, it's, I can't explain it, but when you're, when you're actually really being heard, it's not just the love piece. It's, I can't explain it. It is both of those. However, when they're getting that, then they're getting a sense of that, like you said, confidence. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Confidence is, is so much about your environment. You're, you're not born with it. Uh, you know, uh, I, in fact, I personally used to be very, very shy, the type that would hide behind my mother's skirt. Well, no longer. And I think it's because as, as I have matured, I have gained more confidence in myself. But I had the basics. I had the right foundation in order to build on. Otherwise, I would definitely have been in the uh, you know non, not so confident category. Right foundation, and then you can build on it. So I think a parent's most important job is to provide that uh, foundational element. I think it's beautifully said. So thank you for that. I think, I think the more we start telling parents, hey, you're doing good in this and this and this, and here's why, the more we, more we feel like we're being heard, that builds confidence, and then we feel like we can talk to you more, yes, we want to be loved. And the more we know that we're really truly being loved, the more we truly feel like we're being heard, the more, the more confident we become, the more, the more outward we become, the more we can stand on our own two feet. So that was really beautifully said. Also, let's get into the book now. So if people go out and buy the Ruby Tear Catcher, what are they going to find when they read it? What inspiration are they going to derive from the book? Well, I think the, the greatest inspiration that a reader can gain from this is that despite uh, all odds, all odds, despite um, the conditions, the circumstances that uh, you know there you you can you can always uh, rise above the toughest situations and survive and do well and and move on. Um, 
as in the Ruby Tear Catcher, the story of the protagonist, her name is Leila, she endures some very difficult situations. Um, and I don't, I don't want to give it away, but, uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, in jail, she endures some r very rough times. But despite that, she finds inside of herself the strength to hang on, the strength to believe in herself, the strength to believe in what was right, and to be able to get beyond that and, and uh, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, I would say to win. Um, because we, we all have to go through difficult circumstances, situations in our lives. It's, uh, how, but, but there is nothing that's insurmountable. And I think the, the story line is about, again, believing in yourself and, and being able to, and, and that's the tip for survival in her case. Wonderful. Now this is also going to be a podcast, so can you please let everyone know where they can find you? Uh, do you mean the website? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the, There is a website called www.therubytearcatcher.com uh, and of course uh, the book can be purchased on Amazon as well as Barnes & Noble uh, online basically. Wonderful. Is there anything else you'd love to leave with our audience and let them, letting them know either anything about you yourself in particular or anything you'd like to share? It could be about the Iranian um, struggle or uh, a history of whatever you'd like to share or anything else about the book. Um, really what I would like to leave people with is that I, I guess in this book by writing The Ruby Tear Catcher uh, I had hoped to accomplish a number of things and one of them is to share the beauty of my culture and people with, uh, with everyone because there is a lot of beauty, there's a lot of uh, history and culture and there are many examples of that as I describe a, a, a typical wedding in full detail for instance. Uh, there are traditions that are thousands of years old uh, you know, I go anywhere from the smell of saffron in the bazaar to uh, Persian rugs and uh, kings and sultans and blue tiled mosques, uh, you know, architecture, poetry, all of that is a part of my culture and my people and, and Persia. So I want to leave people with that image that, you know, this is, this is a beautiful place and beautiful people but I also really want to draw attention to the to our oneness that despite uh, the differences that we perceive among us we are more, more alike than we know. In the Ruby Tear Catcher I write a lot of personal things and one of those is uh, really about my husband who lived in a Catholic uh, community for 20 years of his life and here we are you know from a Muslim background from a strict Catholic background and 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 we discovered together how alike we are not just in terms of living together and having the same uh, customs but in terms of how we were raised to think and what we were raised to believe in uh, so it's really uh, a, a story that I hope helps inspire people to be more tolerant of others regardless of our differences. And I think that's beautifully said. Um, I grew up in overseas and went to private Catholic schools but I also had to take world religion and study a lot about theology and I'm also an interfaith ordained minister so I, I love world religion and I agree with you. Uh, my logo is the globe with all of hands and it says we are all interconnected and I really truly honestly believe that I don't think that um, whether it be Wiccan to atheism to, you know, I think even when people think that they're atheism, I don't think they really realize that, you know, we are all inter interconnected whether you, you believe in something or not, because whether they know it or not, they're, they're, they are interconnected um, to, I mean, I, I love parts of Judaism, I love parts of, you know, all religions, I think in, in whether we know it or not, we are connecting to the oneness of everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, whether one believes in whether they are Muslim or they are, they are Islam or the, whether they are, you know, Jewish to Catholic, whatever, on some level we're, we're jumping into something energetic that is energetic everywhere. 
So, well, and Carly, if I may add this, um, religion is is and can be a very good thing, bringing us together in times of need and and helping us to feel we have a community around us to support us. Um, it's unfortunately when it's taken to extreme that it becomes destructive, and that really goes against the fundamentals of every religion that I know of. It isn't about war and killing each other. It isn't about imposing what I believe on you. It's, it's about tolerance and acceptance. That's what religion is about. And I truly believed the prophets that headed the religions that we, we know and love very well, that was their intention. And so when we see uh, zealots act in the way that, that they are, uh, it's, it's unfortunate they give religion a bad name, but those are the extremists. Those aren't the people who are who believe in the religion necessarily. Well, it's no different than money being the root of all evil. It's not necessarily the money; it's what you choose to do with the money. And and that's the same thing. Like you said, it, it it's religion. It I think anything in extremism. I don't care what it is. Is is not healthy. And that that's what's happened with religion. Religion where people go extremism. That's what happens. It becomes unhealthy and becomes into war. Um, it's like anything in life. And unfortunately, like you said, that's what happens with when you take something and you turn it into something that it gives a bad rap. So I really, I really do want to thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. I really encourage everyone to go out and read um, the Ruby Tear Catcher. And like you said, you can go to the rubytearcatcher.com. And thank you so much, Nahid, for joining me. It's been wonderful having you, and I look forward to talking to you again. It was my pleasure, and thank you, Carly, for inviting me to uh, talk with you. Absolutely. So, everyone, you've been on Community Voices with Carly Thorne, and you can find me at carlissathorne.com. I wish everyone a wonderful evening. As usual, I'll put together an entire blog post, which will have all of Nahid's information, links to... Um, her website as well as Amazon and it'll have the embedded podcast as well as embedded video. I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the week and I look forward to seeing everyone next week. Enjoy.